So I'm really excited to welcome to the show Alison Coward today, who is the founder of Bracket Creative. And Bracket Creative help teams work better together. Now, the first time I met Alison was when she was speaking at an agency nomics event and she's a very well-known keynote speaker and I was just struck by how she captivated the audience literally all of these agency leaders were scribbling notes because she was just so so articulate for one but also her speech contained so much fact based you know there was data there was thought leadership that she was quoting books and stat statistics and it was so impressive and we've become friends and I'm for that reason, we've, we're both in the same kind of industries. Alison works with lots of different types of in, uh, industry and companies, but specifically we have an overlap in terms of agencies because she works with agencies. I would love for you, Alison, I know you've got over 15 years experience. I'd love you to just give us a flavor of your experience. Yeah, well, firstly, thank you for having me. Um, I always love our chat, so I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, I think you've given a really good introduction to what I do already. Um, my company is Bracket. I specialise in like team culture and collaboration. I have been working in the creative industries literally most of my career. And um, specifically what I do at Bracket is around like helping teams to become more creative, more productive together, essentially looking at like high performance, like how can they make the most of the talents of the team and um, get them to work together so they can achieve amazing things together and enjoy it while they're doing it as well. And so I do a lot of workshop facilitation, um, which are sessions where I bring teams together, helping them to um, have productive discussions and you know figure out what they're going to do how they're going to do it strategy sessions kickoff sessions brainstorming you know new idea type brainstorming sessions as well the other thing that I do around that is a lot of my work is influenced by workshop facilitation and I'll probably get into that a little bit later but I also do kind of training and coaching and consultancy because I think one of the things that's really important to me is that people um, within teams become owners of their culture and responsible for their culture. So I'm really kind of quite keen on helping people to develop the skills that I have in particularly in facilitation and how they can have better conversations about how they work together. Fantastic. What I love, you always pop up on LinkedIn and it's not necessarily that you're posting, it's because your clients tend to post about the experience of working with you mm. and they're usually just glowing with great oh, feedback. So I know that you do some great work in the world. And why specifically, like turning our attention specifically to agencies, because mm. this is the audience that I'm talking to mainly, why do you think it's important for agencies to pay attention to their team culture? Yeah, so I mean, my I, I come from the creative industries and the create like a creative background. So my history is in working with creative people, people that have you know have got creativity as their currency. And um, there's one thing about like being creative, but then there's another thing about the conditions that foster more creativity and foster high performance. And that often comes down to things like the culture, like, you know, how easy is it for people to put forward ideas? How like supported do they feel in their environment? How easy, like how comfortable do they feel taking risks and making mistakes in front of their team members? And that's all cultural. So within an agency environment, focusing on the aspects around the team, which kind of create the environment for people to do their best work is super important. You know, you can be creative without some of those conditions but if you do put those things in place then you're going to get much more kind of productivity and creativity from the team and as I say they're going to enjoy doing it as well and you know enjoyment is a big part enjoyment and engagement is a big part of doing great work it's not kind of you know you do the work and then you have fun it's it's completely interlinked if you can enjoy what you do then you produce better outputs it's just as simple as that it's so true. I mean, you mentioned the creative output, which is so key to what we do as an industry and how great team collaboration and culture can foster that. What do you think the impact on the agency's bottom line is as a result mm. of a, a strong team culture? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing that comes to mind when you when you talk about that is, um, and this is what I spoke about about at the agent, agency nomics event it was one of the things that i mentioned was the idea of psychological safety um it was a, a study that came well actually psychological safety comes from i think it was coined by someone called amy Ed edmondson um who's an academic and she does a lot of work around like teams and teaming but when google did this internal research study into what made their most high performing teams they found that psychological safety was right at the top of the list um and 
you know, they thought when they, they, they did this research because they wanted to understand like what made the best teams perform highly and how could they replicate that? And they thought they were going to look at find things like, um, you know, IQ and like aspects like technical expertise, that kind of thing. But everything that they found was like more cultural. And at the top of the list was this idea of psychological safety, which is people feeling feeling safe to um, make mistakes and take risks and learn from their mistakes um, all within a team environment. So, I mean, if Google were finding that this was what made them high performing teams, and I definitely think it's something that we should probably all take notice of. Um, there's lo- I mean, there's loads of research studies I sort of can reel s- some off if I kind of look through my notes, but research that shows that when people are more engaged um, it leads to more productivity when people are happier in their work it leads to more productivity when people have good connections with their colleagues at work it leads to more productivity so there's I mean there's loads out there um, that show that concentrating on culture is not I mean I think the problem with culture is that it, it can seem in- intangible that I think it's a mixture of so many different aspects that it might be hard to pinpoint exactly which thing is having an impact on the bottom line but all of it together definitely does Mm. I love that point about psychological safety and it's it's quite a well-known study in certain circles but if someone's listening to this and it's the first time they've heard that concept and they're thinking actually I want to make sure as a leader of an agency that I am creating an environment that's that my staff feel that they are psychologically safe, that they can Mm. admit they've made a mistake or take risks. Why would they know they hadn't created that environment? What would they look for? What would they look for? So um, honesty. Are people able to be honest? Um, Are are you able to um, constructively critique your teammates and team members' ideas without, you know, it turning into unproductive conflict are you getting ideas from people because the thing is is if it's not psychologically safe and then people are going to be afraid to say something that they think might be stupid um and we you know we know in the brainstorming session that often it's those kind of terrible those ideas that seem terrible at first that lead to to innovation so if you're not getting those kind of terrible ideas i guess that's a good way of kind of seeing that you haven't got psychological safety because people don't feel safe sharing them or playing around or kind of, you know, experimenting. So I think those those are some of the signs. Like, do you feel that people are being honest, are able to speak up and be honest? I mean, you can look at your meetings, for example. Um, and I guess this is not always a sign of psychological safety, but it can be one of the things to look out for. But when you're running your meetings, um, are people speaking up? And does it feel like an environment where people do feel that they can speak up without getting, um, you know, any kind of, and push back or um, you know being blamed for getting something wrong or made mm. to feel stupid. This is so interesting because presumably if it takes a lot of self-reflection maybe and self-awareness yeah. on behalf of an agent or agency leader for example to to recognize that and maybe it's the middle management maybe that spot what's happening mm. as a dynamic and to that point can you talk to us when when an agency comes to you someone from an agency who typically comes to you and what kind mm. of sort of symptoms do they explain to you um, as to why they think they need to address their team culture yeah well do you know what Jenny this is super interesting and this is something that I've discovered over the past um couple of years through looking at who comes to me I mean first of all it depends on the size of the agency but often it is like an agency leader that comes to me I find that the teams or the agencies that are really in trouble I don't see them because they don't know what they don't know they don't know that you know it's 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 likely that they haven't even registered that culture is something that is important to to focus on or they've completely dismissed it as something um, and they think that it's a luxury and something not necessary. The teams that come to me, they're already on their way to um, exploring or looking at a team culture. I often tend to work, I mean, I have it on my website that I I work with forward thinking teams because I really think that the the people that come to me are the people that are already doing a lot right and they want to know how do we keep this going? We're growing, things are changing. How do we make sure that we maintain our culture because they already see how important it is or they might be at the kind of early stages of that. They're starting to kind of come round to the idea that we need to spend a little bit of time and resource on our culture. So I don't really... I can't really say that I kind of see people that have like, you know, um, 
like you say, the symptoms. But it's, you know, it's usually all the kind of things that we want to make sure that people feel included. We want to um, become more collaborative. We want to run our meetings better. So yeah, there's, it, it's usually kind of towards the other end. That's so interesting, isn't it? It's almost like I can't tell you that this is important. You almost have to decide that it's important and then look for some help in how to make it better. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's not like you said around the self-awareness. It's, this is not easy work. Um, you know, there are kind of things that you can do to get things going and to start things off, which will make an, an impact. But actually the self-awareness, you know, if you've got a leader that all of a sudden realises that their meetings aren't a place where people can speak up, that does take kind of like a, an admission that maybe I'm not running these meetings in the most effective way, which is like a self-criticism, which, you know, some people aren't ready for. Mm. How do you think um, the whole situation with covid um mm. and this global pandemic where we've all had to work remotely how what effect do you think that's had on generally across the board on team culture massive impact i think if people weren't thinking about it before they're definitely thinking about it now people have really seen i mean in the conversations that i've had and um, people have really seen the connection and engagement piece like how do we stay connected as a team when we're not sitting next to each other and um yeah, meetings, online meetings, Zoom meetings, like how do we run our meetings to make them more engaging and we make the best use of our time. I think, you know, again, one of the things that I was was quite interested in at the start of the pandemic, you know, this was something that none of us had experienced before. Like I was kind of looking around at teams and thinking, is the stuff that I've been doing with teams over these years, is it relevant in these times? Does it work? Is it, you know, is it going to hold up? So I was kind of, you know, just observing and seeing what was going on. But one of the things that I remember um, quite distinctly at the start of the pandemic was, you know, th there was kind of like that initial rush to get everyone working from home. So everyone focused on like the tech and like, can we work from home? And there was this kind of like um, wave of Zoom screenshots on LinkedIn yeah. of like, you know, people with, you know, maybe with the silly hats on or, you know, showing that we're all working from home, we, we can all do it, we can all work from Zoom. And me sort of like thinking, it's great that you've been able to get on Zoom, but that's not culture. That's not team culture. Team culture actually happens in between those Zoom meetings. Um, so I think there was kind of, a, I think, a realisation of what culture really is. Um, not just kind of people feeling good and happy and the kind of, you know, the, the Friday night down the pub. Um, it's really all of everything and all the stuff that we can't see as well and um, how people feel about their work. Give, um, us a, give us a few examples of what good looks like. Um, good looks like, I, think I, was, I mean, I've spoken about a lot of it. Good looks like um, anybody being able to say, this isn't working in the way that we work together. Let's improve it. This, it looks like anybody within a team standing up and saying, um, I would like to improve this within our culture. Like, what can we do together? It, it, it means somebody in a team, I mean, I talk a lot about facilitation and I think that's really key to meeting. So for me, an ideal, this doesn't always happen, but an ideal is anybody being able to facilitate those meetings and every, all of those meetings being productive and the best use of everyone's time. It looks like a team, like if you were to ask a team, like what is it that you're all working towards? Everyone would be 100% super clear um it looks like a team being aware of the value of their teammates and their team members understanding everyone else's contributions as well as their own and having empathy to how people work differently yeah there's a there's a there's a mixture of things lots i mean i could go on forever really but yeah it looks like a resilient team you know like if a how well does a team stand up like if something changes within the team it could be a pandemic. I mean, we've kind of experienced that now. But how resilient is the team? Like, how does a team kind of bounce back quickly? Or how does the team kind of rally round and support each other through that? So those are the, those are the kinds of things that I look for in, in cultures, in team if, culture. If someone's listening to this and, and thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm a leader in, in a business and I believe that we've got a bit of a problem. You know, mm. I don't see people standing up and presenting ideas. I don't see people being quite bold in their thoughts and mm. being able to express themselves. Where do you even start? Like, what can you give us a few tips for someone yeah. listening that think think what they could do about it? 
Mm. So it, it, again, it depends on sort of what stage you're at. Like if things are really broken, then obviously you need to kind of address it more sensitively. So in that case, I might suggest like one-to-one conversations with team members, an anonymous survey, um, those kinds of things to kind of gather thoughts and feedback and that actually listening to that feedback, not kind of dismissing it because you don't agree with it or it kind of sounds quite threatening, but actually really listening to it and taking it to heart and then looking at what can change in an in an in a team where you can start to have those conversations have an open conversation about like what's what's not working for us and what is working and where do we want to be as a team and therefore how can we get there again that kind of takes a certain level of connection within the team already in place because people need to trust it and trust that it's going to lead to something but starting small is super key like the worst thing is to kind of make these massive promises that everything's going to change and then not be able to live up to that promise because a big part of this is behavior change behavior of the leader and behavior of the people in the team as well so making sure that whatever you kind of at least start with is a kind of a small shift so you know starting with our weekly meeting um, how can we improve that? How can we make our weekly meeting more collaborative and more inclusive? And working on that over a period of time and seeing the shift. And if you see the shift in your in that weekly team meeting, you're going to start seeing the shifts other, in other places, as well as building up the momentum to kind of try new things, because the team would have seen that actually they said that the meetings weren't working. They were involved in figuring out what makes what will make that meeting work. And then they started to see those changes actually take place. And they can feel the difference. It's such great tips, such great advice. Recently, I heard of an agency who had been listening to their team, which is great, as Mm. you say. And the feedback was, we're having too many internal meetings. Everyone's zoomed out, they're exhausted. And they wanted some control back on their diaries. Mm. So they decided to have a no internal meetings day a week, you know. (laughs) And what else have you seen other examples of little initiatives that have been helpful to teams? In the pandemic, one of the things that I've seen is, and I've advised teams on, and I've seen teams doing this as well, is making space for the social connection. Um, Because we don't have that now, do we? We don't have the kind of, we can just walk over to someone's desk and ask them a question or say, let's kind of take a coffee break together. So actually making the start, being intentional and making the space for that. I've heard of some teams using, uh, there's like a little... um, a plugin on Slack called Donut, which randomly pairs people for coffee. Um, so there's that, the social connection. Um, what else is there? What else have I seen? Um, so the no meeting days is something that I've seen as well. One team that I've worked with actually um, gave the example of giving everybody, um, like rotating the responsibility of um, doing a little activity at the start of a team meeting, um, which was a fun activity. And everybody had responsibility in their kind of... Um, in turn to do that to kind of involve them and to kind of surprise the team also what else have I seen um gosh lots of things um, I think also one of sort of very simple I mean personally I've seen leaders investing in this more so actually getting in um external facilitators like myself to work with their teams to have these kinds of conversations when teams haven't done that before you know so that that can make a difference I mean there's there's a lot of follow-up to be done after that so the workshop in itself is not the kind of you know tick we've done it actually it's the kind of the start of a conversation I've seen much more of that and much more sort of leaders willing to invest in like away days and like team discussions and those kinds of things to talk about how they work together as well see that would make total sense to me that you Mm. would get someone in externally to conduct that I mean it might take a you know a certain amount of humility because you don't know what you're going to find out but I would have thought that a third party people would be much more likely to open up and presumably they do to you they do they do and I mean on that as well is that I am you know obviously I I do uh, facilitation as an external person and I see the value of it and I do see the kind of value of sort of having someone from the outside be able to spot that my aim with teams at the same time is eventually for them to be able to do that themselves because I don't, I don't think that this these kinds of conversations and discussions should be reserved as a special thing um I think that this is how people should be running their meetings they should be open they should be collaborative they should be um a space where people feel that they can be honest um, and constructive and kind of problem solve together so at the same time as you know I do see the value in every now and again getting kind of the external facilitator in to support those discussions especially if a team has never done it before because a facilitator knows how to handle those dynamics but encouraging a team to have those discussions more frequently and eventually take responsibility for the facilitation themselves. 
I love that. It's almost, it, it's much better to make that investment to almost course correct the agency and then give them the tools and the skills 100%. to can carry on. I love that. 100%, yeah. Where, where do you see this evolving? What kind of trends mm. are you seeing for the future? Is this just going to carry on being something that mm. we invest time in? I hope so. I mean, I have, since I've started the business, I've definitely seen a shift in the way, in the recognition of the importance of team culture and it's accelerated in the last few months. In terms of kind of like the, the complete end of the scale, where I hope teams will get to, where, where I really want to see teams get into is that they do take responsibility, like everybody on the team takes responsibility for the culture. So it is like a kind of self evolving, self-sustaining, continuously developing team culture rather than it kind of being seen as something that you do once and then it's kind of done. And the reason I, I see that happening is because change is, uh, it's, I mean, change is normal now. Like change, we should expect change. And a team needs to be able to kind of take themselves through those changes. I mean, it's great if you can bring an external person in, but what, what's much more powerful is if the team themselves have the skills to be able to kind of adapt and respond to what change is happening around them. So that's where I hope team culture is going in that it becomes like much more a natural part of the, the work conversation. We're not just focusing on the output and what it is that we need to create, but we're also having conversations about how, how we get there together. I think this is fantastic. I've, I've got a question for you. With the way we've been working recently, particularly agencies, obviously this is really super relevant where you have a team that you want to enhance the way they work and be more productive, be more collaborative. What about if agencies now are getting more freelance talent now and again for, mm. for different projects bringing in teams from around the world because now we've opened up the market to the world haven't mm. we for working on projects together do you have any advice or thoughts around how to do that efficiently when it's mm. just more about maybe you know short-term contracts with people yeah i mean to be honest this is where bracket started bracket started off as an agency that brought together freelance talent and that's where all of these concepts that i've kind of, um, and these, this methodology and this framework, it's evolved out of that through the knowledge of like what it takes to bring independent experts together into short-term teams. And, you know, because they're working together in a, over a short period, they need to kind of perform well quickly, right? So um, it's all of the same principles, just intensified, um, you know, get the team together, get everyone in the team together from the start whether they're freelance or whether they're internal, get the whole team generating like how they're going to work together and what they're going to work together on. Like what's the what's the final idea? Make it collaborative from the start and keep everyone involved um, so that everyone's got a bit of ownership over how the project goes rather than kind of coming in and doing a little bit that they can only see, you know, their, their part. They need to be able to see the bigger picture. Um, so that's that's exactly what I was doing when I first started up Bracket, which was like bringing these teams together, no matter what their kind of discipline was, getting everyone together at the start of a project, having a discussion about like, you know, this is what the client wants. This is the, the, the skills that we have on the team. But what can we do? What does it look like? And how are we going to work together to make that happen? And I mean, I mean, this is a long time ago now, but I remember this is how I started facilitating because I didn't really do facilitation before that. But I just remember like all of those sessions, the, the freelancers enjoyed it so much because they were kind of, they felt much more part of the project rather than kind of being handed a, a, a piece and um, that they would take away, do, and then, and then kind of deliver. It just feels like such a no-brainer, doesn't it? It does. It does. Yeah, it does. Um, I've been talking about it for ages. And I think for me, and you know, I know there's lots of complexities involved within um, companies and agencies and teams and organisations. At the same time, I think that if we kind of kept it simple, which is, you know, how do we get great people together to do great work? That's what we want, right? Um, we would kind of probably make it a lot easier on ourselves. Absolutely. And you want to get it right first time, don't you? Because time is money. And the longer yeah. they have to work, you know, over and above the original brief, it's just costing everyone mm -hmm. money. So it's just, it's absolutely no brainer. It's been fantastic. The The amount of information you've shared, Alison, and the insight you've provided is, is great. I know you have a team culture program, mm -hmm. which obviously you've been iterating over years. So it's now probably a well-oiled program with all mm -hmm. of your experience. Can you tell us a bit about that? 
Yeah, so the um, the programme is almost like a combination of everything that I know and do and have, have done with teams over the years. So it's a mixture of like facilitation, i.e. getting the team together to create ideas, figure out like, you know, what it is that they're working towards, what their team purpose is, all that kind of stuff, um, as well as training. So this idea of ensuring that teams have the skills to kind of sustain this. Um, so teaching them things like facilitation and how they would have conversations about designing new ways of working together, um, as well as team coaching as well, because every team is unique. There's no kind of like cookie cutter approach for, you know, um, making a team work. A team culture depends on who's in it, what they're working on, the nature of their work, um, what that team looks like together, the environment that they're working within. So the, the, the coaching addresses the specific issues for that, that specific team. Um, and it's a mixture of all of that stuff. So yeah, training, facilitation, coaching, consultancy, um, to get a team to a level where not only do they know what they're working on, they know their culture, they know their identity, but they've got the tools and the skills to kind of sustain that. If any changes happen or someone joins the team, someone leaves, if they face a new challenge together as a team as well. I can imagine that it's not only an effective process to go through, but also a fun process. Yeah, I should hope so. Yeah, I always <laughs> hope that it's fun to work with me. But yeah, yeah. The thing is with, with this as well is that, you know, I've I've learned a lot. As you say, I've been doing this for, for quite a while and I've learned a lot about um, teams and kind of, you know, evolved my own thinking around it. And I think when I first started doing this, I was so focused on collaboration and, you know, the team as a unit. And I kind of, I wouldn't say that I forgot about, but I didn't really see the relevance of the individuals within the team, which sounds bizarre, but I was kind of looking at the team as a, as a whole rather than the individuals in the, in, in the team. And then it kind of dawned on me that if you want a team to perform well together, then those individuals need to perform well individually right they need to be self-aware they need to kind of know what their opportunities of, uh, for development are they need to know um, how they fit into the kind of collective goal of the team so you kind of need to work on those two levels so the program kind of works with the team in terms of the dynamics of all of those people coming together but also works with the individuals to ensure that they are engaged and connected and you know their areas of development that's being focused on in terms of how do they contribute to the to the bigger picture makes total sense what are the first few steps that you take when you start working with an agency and um, so there's an assessment there's lots of kind of interviews and kind of where are you now um I actually designed a, a bit of an assessment which is um on my website um just about to be released actually so it kind of helps teams to figure out what stage they're at whether they need to fix their culture whether they need to build it whether they need to sustain it but anyway you know after that it's like a five minute quiz and there's more investigation into like what are the actual dynamics in the team like what do people in the team feel like the priorities are to address or fix or improve or or work on and then we'll set up a plan um, around that so there's the five pillars of the program which are the kind of things that I've learned that are important for high performing teams but then there's all the pieces in between which is where the team gets to really address the the issues based on their own specific culture sounds like a really useful tool we'll certainly put the link to your website Thank because you. I think even if it's not live yet when when someone listens to this I'm sure by the time they listen it'll it'll be yeah. live how do you get inspired Alison like who Ooh. who do you follow what what kind of sources of inspiration do you go to? I'm always reading. Um, I do sort of, you know, I've got some Google alerts set up for things like um, collaboration and creativity. Do you know what? I get a lot of inspiration from, um, it sounds really boring, but I get a lot of inspiration from academic papers. I really love reading, um, you know, kind of like research papers on um, meetings and the connection to well-being and like how to, you know, increase creativity and productivity and the value of facilitation. So I get a lot of inspiration from those kinds of those kinds of studies yeah I mean I love hearing about teams that feel that they're doing good work and kind of seeing examples of things that they're putting in place um, to get inspiration I think so one thing that's important is that you know you may see something work in one team culture and you can take inspiration from it but it may not work for you in exact that in that exact same way um you may need to kind of adapt it so I do like kind of reading about teams and what they're doing and sort of what they've learned as well um 
so yeah and I've got like a stack of books behind me there that I need to need to get you as well you are probably one of the most well-read people I know and it was clear from your from your talk that you did I mean it was just bam 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 with all these statistics and it was just you know it's evidence-based everything that you talk about is evidence-based so I think I think it's really really powerful who if someone's listening to this who ideally is the ideal person that you think you can help the most like who would you Hmm. want to contact you and how would they do that yeah I think anybody that's got responsibility for a for a team and is able to invest resources in you know their development essentially so whether that's kind of a a middle manager within a larger organization or a senior leader within a smaller agency although I'm happy to talk to anybody to be honest like I you know sometimes I I go in and I do kind of you know coaching with people that want to learn to facilitate more effectively even sort of people I mean one of the things that I feel quite passionate about as well is that obviously from a business point of view certain people that are able to kind of invest in what I do but I'm also really passionate about helping people that work within teams who might not be at that level but really can see that there's things that they can improve and they've got like a real passion to to make their working environment and their team's working environment better so if you're one of those people then feel free to get in touch because I always like talking to to people like you as well and you can go to my website bracketcreative.co.uk or find me on LinkedIn Alison Coward fantastic have you got any final pieces of advice for anyone listening to this about team culture um yeah I I mean I think I said it before but start small you know this is I think you know you can um feel very passionate about improving team culture and I think that's great like definitely if you're in the stage where you think like this is something we want to work on and but be realistic about what it takes for people to change their behavior like it's not instant it is, you know, um, something that you will work on over time and hopefully continue to work on. So um, taking like a small first step just to get the ball rolling, just to get buy-in, just to get people um, feeling a bit motivated that change can happen and then then go from there. Thank you. That's great advice. I love talking to you, Alison. You can see in your eyes how passionate you are about this subject. So I hope people will get in touch and benefit from your services. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Thank Thank you. you.